Hello, I'm Bob Houghton, President of the Georgia Association of Broadcasters. It's our privilege today to welcome FCC Chairman Ajit Pai to Georgia. Ajit Pai was appointed to the position of FCC Commissioner by President Obama in 2012 and named Chairman of the FCC by President Trump in 2017. Chairman Pai is a believer in bus regulation, more technology, is a great friend and supporter of broadcasters. Prior to speaking to the Georgia Chamber of Commerce, Chairman Pai is meeting with the GAB. JB Communications Director Mackenzie Lewis joins me and Commissioner Pai, Chairman Pai, uh, for this video conversation with Georgia broadcasters. Thanks, Bob, and thank you, Chairman Pai, for joining us here today. We're so honored to have you. So the Georgia Association of Broadcasters is actually celebrating our 85th anniversary this year. We are the first and oldest state association in the entire United States, and that's something we're really proud of, and we're really proud to have you be a part of that today. Well, congratulations on the anniversary. Actually, we're 85 years old as well, so uh, wow. I think the two of us go to well together, and I think it speaks to the great partnership we have had with broadcasters over the years. And so thanks for all the work that you do. I know, especially when emergency strike, like the uh, tornado that recently uh, went through Alabama, it was broadcasters in the Columbus, Georgia market that stood, stood up. And uh, that's in your DNA. And that's one of the things that we cherish is the fact that broadcasters are always there in a pinch, always there to inform you, always there to help keep you safe, and ultimately uh, always help to find the community together. So congratulations, and here's to 85 more years of success. Thank you. We share a birthday. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So just piggybacking off of that a little bit, so yeah, uh, this past month was you know the tragedy in Alabama and Columbus, and it's so sad, but something like that is really where broadcasters shine and do their best work as their role as first informers. It's really incredible, and I've seen that across the country. It's not just here in Georgia, but in the wake of hurricanes Harvey and Irma and Maria, I had a chance to see in Texas and Florida and Puerto Rico the fact that broadcasters were the ones when all of these other communications networks were going down, they were the ones literally keeping the lights on, keeping people safe, at, at great peril to themselves. And that's the kind of work I really cherish. And even when times are good, and you're the ones covering the high school football games on Friday, you're the ones covering the Sunday church service, you're the ones who are there helping you do food drives and all those other kinds of things that really make us uh, to bind together as a community. And so I'm really grateful, not just as a regulator, but as a viewer and a listener. Uh, it really makes a big difference. Thank you. We appreciate that. And we're very proud of the way our member stations handled that situation. So something we've been reminding our members of recently is the upcoming radio license renewal. So yeah. for Georgia, that deadline is December 1st. So that, Dece that December 1st deadline comes up quicker than you'd think. Uh, as I always tell my kids, uh, you'll just do it today, you won't have to do it tomorrow. And the same thing applies to the FCC's rules and regulations too, especially things like migrating some of that information into the online public file. I know that there's a lot that broadcasters, especially smaller broadcasters, have on their plates. But this is a really important requirement, and it's one of the things that uh, we have to scrutinize. And so I definitely urge broadcasters to get ahead of the game, uh, take care of it as soon as you can, and uh, then move to what you do best, which is to covering the local news and uh, uh, informing people. That's, uh, I know, the core part of the business, but we just want to make sure that these rules are applied to too. So about those online public files, so this will really be the first year that this is going to be tested. How do you see that impacting the alternative broadcast and spectrum programs? I think it will have a, some impact, and uh, hopefully uh, if the, uh, uh, that my online migration goes smoothly, uh, we can have a transition that no one will ever notice. Uh, you know, the FCC won't take notice of it. Broadcasters will just uh, make it part of the routine, and in later years we'll kind of laugh that there was ever a big transition period, hopefully. So the purpose of your meeting here today is to talk about 5G technology. Yeah, yeah. so this is the next generation of wireless connectivity, and we're really bullish about what the prospects are for America's wireless consumers. As uh, the world goes wireless, so to speak, uh, we want to make sure that we are staying in the game. So talking about uh, you know, auctioning off more spectrum, getting more infrastructure out there, allowing people, especially in rural areas, to take advantage of this digital revolution. We don't know exactly what the 5G internet economy is going to look like, but we know that it's going to be big, and we want that innovation and investment to happen in the United States. How do you see this 5G technology influencing the broadcast industry? I think it's going to be tremendous. Uh, so, for example, with the introduction of ATC 3.0, I frankly see that as almost like a 5G type application. The internet protocol based delivery of broadcast information is essentially a way of getting a pipe into every single smartphone that's out there. And so I think it actually gives broadcasters a great chance to compete 
digital landscape, and as uh, more and more consumers seem to be thinking about the alternative uh, delivery mechanisms, uh, you know, when I was a kid, television meant a big box that sat on your TV and you had to be there at 8 o'clock on Sunday to watch the love boat. Well, now uh, these devices are with us all the time, and that means the broadcasters have to think about reaching them uh, in whatever way the consumer finds friendly. I think ATSC and 5G go well together. Yeah. And we're excited to hear a little bit more about that later this morning with the event with the Georgia Chamber. So one more question we wanted to bring up is the repack. So um, for those of you who are watching this that may not exactly know what all repack entails, Bob is going to bring you up to speed a little bit. Well, 2016, wireless carriers built nearly $20 billion, and resulting in over a 1,000 broadcasters that will have to move, repack, relocate their spectrum position. Congress declared there would be no harm to broadcasters and established a $1.7 billion fund in the many months to make the transition. Last year, an initial billion dollars was, was provided for the move. No more time was asked for. However, this winter, we've had a severe winter, it severely affected phase two, which is supposed to end next month. The question is, what happens if that slows down the process and it's going to take more than 30 minutes? Wireless carriers want what they paid for, and broadcasters want no harm. Is there enough time to finish the put If not, then what? We certainly hope so. With respect to phase one, we were actually ahead of the game. We were planning to repack about a 90 station repack, repack 143 in advance. And so we're very optimistic uh, with respect to phase one. Phase two, might, uh, you might see some more difficulties, but I've consistently said to Congress, to the broadcasters, to the American public, that if we get a sense that that phase, uh, any phase, is out of whack, uh, we want to take note of it. And now, because Congress has given us additional resources, they added to that 1.75 billion an additional billion and also extended protection for TV translators, FM radio stations, and others. We're hopeful that we can make sure that that core promise of the incentive option, which is that broadcasters that stay in the business will be kept made whole, they don't want to have to pay out of their pocket for any relocation that's out of their control. We want to make sure that uh, we, we fulfill that promise. And so we're continuing to monitor the situation. We have a great incentive option task force back in Washington that's constantly giving me updates on this. And the Georgia broadcasters, if any broadcasters across the country see anything that we should take note of, let us know. It's much better to be proactive and flag something for us because we are the eyes and ears on the ground. Uh, we, we can't know about where there might be a shortage of work crews or uh, you know the antennas uh, just can't be installed because of weather or whatever. We need to know that kind of information. Thank you, we appreciate that. Absolutely. And one last question we have for you is, we hear you're a really big basketball <laughs> fan. I know your Jayhawks are only a four seed right now, but any yeah. predictions for the tournament? Uh, so this is one of the years where I'm, I'm usually sour on Kansas anyway, but I'm just, I'm just, we always tend to go out early. This year in particular, I'm very, very nervous. I mean, the team has been up and down especially in the region we're in. I, I was just mentioning to a friend that you know, if we get through North Carolina, uh, well, somehow in the third round, I think it is, the board is going to be Kentucky in, in the fourth. And so I, it's going to be really tough. But I think all of America, you know, there's so many things that divide us right now. I would hope that the one thing can unite us is for the top seed Duke to go down at some point. It just, it's, it's the right thing to do. So whoever can make that happen in the tournament, please make that happen. Bring, bring together America. Exactly. Bring down the Giants. What are your predictions, Bob? Well, Chairman, I'm a Big Ten guy, so I'm, ah. I'm expecting Michigan State to do what you asked for and bring down Duke in that region. So I expect to see Michigan return to the Final Four along with Michigan State, so two Big Ten teams will hey, pass there. there. Yeah. And then two ACC teams, but not Duke. Virginia and North Carolina. Yeah. So those, those are my picks. Now you didn't fail to mention, though, that if Kansas does get through the first round, they're in a home court advantage in Kansas City. That, which is always nice. Yeah. The, the, I will say the tournament selection committee sometimes does <laughs> a little favor there. So hopefully it bears some fruit. We'll see. It's a, North Carolina is fun to watch. If we, if we ultimately get that far, and they do, that's going to be a heck of a game. Well, you had a full day in Georgia yesterday, a full day today. We very much appreciate the time you've been broadcasters from the state of Georgia. Thank you very much. We hope to maybe get you back for one of our 85th anniversary events. I would love to come back, especially uh, later on in the spring or summer. It would be great to be back in the Peach State. We'd love to have you. Thank you very much, Bob, and thank you very much, Chairman Pye, for your time, and thank you for watching. Thanks a lot. This is great. Yeah, this is awesome. Yeah, really appreciate it.